be a skill-based thing? How do you balance it with luck? Um, how do you uh, work on your feet you know, within that problem space um, when bad luck happens? Now you've got to reconfigure things. So you sort of have to know the content in order to do that. Um, so I would have my students create games themselves or adapt games that, you know, popular games like Monopoly or whatever to whatever the content is at hand. But I've not ever really thought about like, well, let's create a, a, a fun little escape place for the students to go so that they can get to know each other, um, almost like an online icebreaker, I guess. Um, so if people have ideas for online icebreakers, that would be a great way to sort of get them to start building that trust that they need to have um, so that they can start working effectively together. Any ideas? I have a good wrap up one, but it's a synchronous. You can email me if you want the template, but at the end of the courses, I do a PowerPoint family feud and I've done it virtually by just sharing my application here and we play a fun game of wrapping up of lessons learned of, of, the, of the, the course using Family Feud. If you want the template, I'll send it to you, but it, it works well synchronously, but I haven't tried it asynchronously. I'm, I'm doing some Google searches right now um, for, here's one for the discussion forum called Inline. Um, in that link that I just shared in the in the in the chat, so it's a way for them to do that in a discussion forum. Um, one word, another thing of an image. So you've seen the um, many of you have probably seen this. Um, oh, Marjean, what's the what's the thing with that stack of photos where you or Karen, maybe you remember this one too, um, where you take a photo and you say, pick a photo that represents you, you know, the way that you feel or that represents um, how you see online instruction or whatever, whatever. I suppose you could do the same sort of thing with go on the internet and find a photo that represents what you think of online instruction or what you think of whatever your content problem is. Um, or perspective of it and then share it in a discussion or share it in a, a Padlet or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I had not thought about any of these Google's uh, Google options. Mm -hmm. so this is Jeannie. I, as you're talking, John, I'm remembering um, a, a synchronous webinar that I was on once where there were a, a reasonable number of people, like say people, and the task for everyone to get to know each other a little bit was to uh, um, look at their feet, identify the shoes that they were wearing, or in this environment, since half of us aren't even dressed from the waist down, <laughs> not wearing shoes, um, you could say, if you were <laughs> wearing shoes today, which what would be the pair of shoes you would pick? And then tell a story about where those shoes have taken you, how many miles they have on them, and what kinds of, um, experiences and memories are conjured when you look at that particular pair of shoes. And it ended up being really fascinating because it, you know, went from soup to nuts for people talking about all the people they were with, memories they shared about their families or their kids or, you know, a trip they'd taken or whatever. It was, it was kind of an interesting one. And it didn't take that long because everybody didn't share, just, you know, 10 people shared. So this is, this is reminding me, Dean, of um, a, a tip for inclusive learning that Marcus Brower shared at the um, at the Teaching Academy Fall Retreat. One of the things that they've done research on and have found that uh, really promotes not just success in your own class, but in the students' sort of class trajectory, is to have the the um, as you start the class, have the students write down something that they value. So when you talked about memories and um, family trips and such that was like, oh yeah, that's right. That's, this reminds me by simply by, even if it has nothing to do with a class, simply yeah. by having them share or write down something that they value, it gets them into the sort of this, I don't know how it works exactly. So I'm, I'm making stuff up right now, but it connects with, I value something and I'm, my head is in a value state right now. So maybe that then transfers over to your learning. 
I don't know how it works, but I'm told that it works. So it seems like it humanizes people. Yeah. And if you get in touch with your humanity first, no matter what your subject area is, you are a human being who's engaging with that material and content. And that invites you to uh, engage with other people as human beings instead of just opinions or political persuasion, persuasions or something like that. So I think that makes perfect sense. Great. And part of that humanity is, is, is as, as an instructor, modeling vulnerability. So sharing out yourself. Um, making mistakes online in this virtual environment and then recovering, modeling how to recover from that um, rather than being like, oh my gosh, I'm such a terrible instructor. I, I can't do technology. It's like, oh, that one, that totally didn't work. Let's try it again. Yeah. I, I think that that's, you're onto something. I'm talking too much. Sorry, please. It's not Any only other that, ideas? It's yeah, not, Tara, uh, Hazel. It's not only that the students get to know each other better, but they also come to know that the educator, the teacher, the facilitator cares about more than just information transfer. They care about aging the whole person in order to maximize and enhance and unleash learning that lasts. Yeah. And the, uh, University of Central Florida, which is a largely online, or, or they have a huge online presence, um, one of the bigger ones in the US. Um, they've done studies on this as well. And one of the big indicators of success is when the students can say, my instructor cares about me or cares about my learning, my ability to learn. If the instructor believes, if you as an instructor show that you are interested in the students and believe in the students' ability to do things, they will they will they will succeed for the most part. That's excellent. Are there other topics from the small groups uh, that anyone wants to share out? I'm switching the slide over to additional prompting kinds of guiding questions. If you if those uh, strike a thought in you. Um, Feel free to raise your hand or just turn on your mic and start talking. Cliff? Um, I've, I've been wondering, uh, so my name is Cliff Cunningham. I work with the Learn at UW team. And uh, I'm just wondering how uh, for the faculty who are starting to use this tool and a lot of this remote connectivity, rem remote training, how comfortable are you finding your students are using this space? I think I myself assume because everybody's younger than me that they're all going to be real smooth and slick and jiggy with it. But uh, are you finding adopt adoption, acceptance, or is there still some awkwardnesses that I would not have expected? Thank you. Uh, just to respond, uh, this is Mike Judge. I uh, I haven't given them a lot of technological stuff to do, like I've contained it in Canvas, but I have to say I haven't received one technology glitch or question yet. So, um, so far, so good anyway. One thing that has surprised me is I feel like my students are reticent to use their video. Um, so when I have a live session with a large audience, I wouldn't necessarily expect that. But even coming to, like I'm holding remote virtual hours or, or virtual office hours, sorry. And, um, you know, even just one-on-one, -on -one, they don't really turn on their video. And I haven't really pressed it because I don't know what state they're in. Um, but yeah, right. <laughs> that surprised me. Do you, do you require them or do you ask them to put their photo in the profile? Um, I haven't, no. Okay. I've been often thinking that as humans, like in face-to-face -face situations, we often, see, in, in the Western culture, um, we see faces and we associate in the classroom faces at least, you know, that's how we interact with each other. Um, and, but 
it's different in an online space because sometimes we just have a an avatar and sometimes it's a generic avatar sometimes it's just a profile picture of our of our face hopefully or sometimes it's a an avatar of or a, a person you know out in the field or a cartoon character that they've uh, uploaded or, or something so I'm, I'm i'm wondering how other people um how do you encourage the students to connect faces and names and John Parrish, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about your your student experience because you, you do have a lot more rural students. Um, are you doing more synchronous classes or are you trying to do more asynchronous classes with discussions and such? Can you share? Well, I've been adding more. So can you hear me? Here yes, thank on you. The video. Just hold on just a quick second. Ah. Okay, so um, uh, I have been doing, I had a lot of stuff online already that was kind of asynchronous, but then we were trying to do synchronous discussions and we're having about 20% of the students are in really rural areas and they're spotty on their ability to connect in or not. So they're always getting thrown in or out of sessions. And um, usually, we can get by with them typing something in the chat window and keeping everything else off on their end, or they end up having to email me about things that are going on or emailing components back to me about what's happening in the class. So, um, but there's a good 20%. And then surprisingly, you know, we also have people that are here in town in apartments and you know that when they're in apartments, that internet is shared with everybody that's in that apartment building, usually. It's not individual to that person. And so their bandwidth goes down dramatically at certain times of the day. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering if people have other strategies for, um, for this sort of uh, internet, well, I guess on, on, on either of the, the issues. Um, Either if they do have a good internet, do you want them to turn on their video, or is does that make it a little bit less fair or equitable um, because some students might not have the bandwidth to be able to do so? And do we pay more attention to the people who have video on? Colleen, you say that you, you specifically do ask the students to turn on their video, so you warn them ahead of time? I do oh, warn them ahead of time. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I do warn them ahead of time, and, you know, simply I just want to see them because I have not seen them for a while. Um, most comply, some don't, and those that don't share the video, it could be connectivity issues or they um, just choose not to that day, which is fine. But I, I find most of them are um, willing to um, be seen online. Yeah, very good. Yeah, but to, um, to echo kind of John's comments, I can't share my video remotely because my bandwidth is horrible. So um, if I try to use video, it just drops me. So um, that in kind of a way isn't really fair, but <laughs> that's how it is. Very good. All right, should we jump into the activity sheet, Karen? Sure, sure. All right. I'll I was just looking at that too, so there was. So it should show up on the screen here in just a second. There it is. Mm -hmm. So up here at the top, I'm we'll highlight, um, and this link uh, someone's going to put in the window here in the chat window again, mm -hmm. so that you can get into it. And 
we have those five tips that we were talking about. And these are not, you know, necessarily the best ever tips, um, but they're they're useful pieces of advice um, to remember to to make this. You, in some ways, it's 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 everybody's responsibility, but oftentimes, as the instructor, it falls on you a little bit more heavily to create situations where the students will interact with each other. So it's not just you and the students in you know one on one with you, and then. 50 individual students individually, but give the students some of the the um, opportunity to um, support you by teaching each other. Elicit those connections. Um, the students will give each other ideas. They'll give each other inspiration. They'll give each other answers um, and help them understand and help them think of ways to understand that you might not be able to do yourself because you know you're old and not cool anymore. But they are. Um, younger and cooler. You might have to give them some points for participation. Now, as as motivated learners, we have gotten to the spaces that we're at right now in our professions because we were interested in this and we built that motivation and we've got it. And, you know, I'll go read an article on educational policies and 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 um, practices just because I'm interested in that. But it wasn't always like that. You know, I needed to get nudged into that and one way to do that is with extrinsic means extrinsic points so if you give them points um, they might take those points and say oh i will do this it is worthwhile for me to do that not because i love the material yet but because i'm going to get some points and then as they get into the material naturally they'll love it right but it's it's a nudge I, it's a thank you margine Expectations, and this is even more important in the online space, I think, because in a in a face-to-face -face environment, we can kind of see their their um, confusion on their faces by looking around the room, and, and we can say, "Oh, they aren't getting it, what I want them to do." But in an online space, if they're not sharing their video and we're just looking at that avatar, we might not know that they are confused. So, being extra careful that we're really clear about what we want them to do and then we check in with them um, and I think I've got that in another thing well check in with them to make sure that they know ask them are you sure what's happening sort of stay with them um, as they go through the beginning processes to make sure that they don't go take a wrong path but that they that they are doing what you want them to do um, Mike Judge talked about this in our in our uh, Google group, um, and this has something to do with the illicit connections on number one. But if you give them the space in Canvas, they they have instructor level access to tools, so they can share images, for example, much easier than they can as a student. They can start um, their own discussions. So if you have a group working on a project, they can on their own without having to come to you and say, hey. Professor, can I um, can you set up a, a, a Canvas discussion for us? They can do that on their own. They can create files. They can create um, pages and all of that stuff. Um, and then offer a variety. And this goes back to Universal Design for Learning. You've got a bunch of different students that are different. They're different from you. They're different from each other. So give them different opportunities. Let them come up with different opportunities and then you honor those um, so that they can learn the way that they need to learn or the way that works well for them. Um, and then help each other find the ways to learn. All right. We're now at the part that, that you are the star of our lab and that is the what do you want to learn? Um, what would you like to talk about? What questions haven't we talked about yet that you can type in? And if you just grab some space after one of these cues and type your question in, we'll have our moderators jump in and, and give you an answer. And then we can talk about these as well. If you see somebody else's question um, and you're like, oh, that's my question too, add a plus in front of it the way that I just did here, a number two. And we'll make sure that we, we hit that as well. And I see that we have some questions in here already. Anybody want to ask 
or restate one of the top ones if you typed it in. Go ahead and unmute your mic and let us know. This is Jeannie. I um, posed the number three question. My students always respond to the discussion prompts, which I um, give points for as stimulation for them to respond. And they do. And some are pretty boring kind of rote responses. But what the, I found in the three times that I've offered my asynchronous online course, they really rarely challenge each other's thoughts. They agree with each other. They say, good idea, great, great strategy. But they don't get into conversations that really are the basis for much of our learning, which is getting feedback about ourselves and, and responding to um, each other when people say things that are questionable in terms of strat professional strategies or just opinions that are not grounded, that kind of stuff. I don't know how to get them to be brave enough to use that space to challenge each other's actual thinking. Oh, that's a great question. How many other people um, just have seen this as well? Um, it's a it's a thing that it's hard in a face to face course. In an online course, it's even harder. Marjean, you have thoughts on this? Yeah, um, actually, I'm watching. Karen stole my. Uh, no, it's not my idea, but um, I think that the idea that's coming up on the sheet right now is that assigning roles can really help. It gives students permission to first think about having another, giving themselves an opportunity to have a different perspective. But if you assign somebody the role like devil's advocate, they give permission to challenge. It's what they're supposed to do. And that can bring up a richer discussion. And I found that as well. I, I use the four, I would have the students in a reading response. Um, I'd have them read something that's somewhat controversial. And role number one, person number one, you've got to be the author advocate. Whatever the author says, you agree with them and you bring in two more pieces of information that, that supports you, their opinion and your opinion. Even if it's not your opinion, it's a rule. You have to do this. Devil's advocate, as Marjane said, whatever your position is on the topic, you have to disagree with the author and bring in two pieces of information. Third rule, mediator. Whatever the topic, you say, ah, author advocate, you're right. Devil's advocate, you're right too. This is how it can work together. That's a hard role sometimes, but you got to do it. And then the fourth one, I just I say, hey, you're the troll. You're the internet troll. Now, you're not really the internet troll. You're not a bad person. We know who you are. Um, so they aren't going to be like real jerks the way that some people are on the internet. But it gives them a, a permission, as Marjean said, to sort of go in and say, well, wait a second, poke, poke, poke. Um, this isn't always necessarily, you know, a, a good thing. What this does, from my perspective, is it gets them used to this this problem of um, being so polite or being so um, afraid of feedback, of criticism, of negativity. Um, we don't like to be challenged. And giving them some exercise or some practice on challenging other people or getting criticism from other people. And again, it's not really criticism. We're all playing a part right now. It's just a role. That sort of eases it and says, OK, I get it. This person doesn't hate me or, or whatever. I, they're just, they have to be the devil's advocate. Karen Skiba, go ahead. I love the role idea, but one thing that I see a lot in faculty, they put a lot, a lot of time in putting together a fantastic first post. And then they say, respond to two others. Do you provide feedback on types of things that they should use to respond? You know, either, you know, look for something that you agree with, disagree with, you know. If you provide guidance on how they should respond, that also helps instead of, you know, not putting all of the energy into that first post, but also explaining what kind of energy and what kind of questions and what kind of things you should be asking in that second post is, is I think is very helpful. I'm going to put in the chat, um, and I'll put it in the activity sheet as well. Um, some it's called Five Tips for Improving Online Discussion Boards, and um, it's on that link that is highlighted um, on the screen as well. 
Right. I also shared are... some rubrics too that share not only how you should evaluate the first post, but how you should evaluate the response post. And I share that with students too. So there's some good rubric examples to look at the second post as well as the first. Great. I think it also I think it also helps to try to reframe disagreement as not necessarily as a personal assault or insult but as a way to contribute to the collective growing in ways that, that we would not if we weren't always high-fiving. So I think Absolutely. The of, of crosstalk, of, of debate, uh, to make it more in the context of dialogue, given the desire to help the whole collective grow beyond just you know, the straight and narrow, bottom line. Very good. Any other quest, uh, points on number three there or thoughts on number three? If not, um, who asked number two and can you talk a little bit more about that? Go ahead, JT. Thanks, John. So I asked number two, just sort of as a, I'm not teaching this summer, but I do have a lot of friends who are teaching in the foreign language departments. And this is a conversation that we've been having um, just sort of amongst, I guess, language teaching nerds um, as friends and sort of trying to figure out how a four hour face to face course in a foreign language or even in any subject, I don't think the discipline is necessarily relevant, um, is going to be condensed to an online course um, without I mean, obviously you could do synchronous the entire time, but that sort of seems like it could be a disaster, but just for questions of scope and variety to keep um, students engaged, but also to keep them, you know, being respectful of these concerns about bandwidth and, con and concerns about access. Um, so how to manage all of that um, in a very intense four week course. Kim, do you want to jump in as a, as a language nerd and, and um, Tim is in our group I, and he's doing synchronous yeah. courses right now. I don't really I have much to add, but hi, hi, JT. I am one of those um, teachers who will be teaching um, the, the language courses this summer, so four hours a day. And I'm just anxious to hear your ideas. I don't have any myself, but um, I'd love some input. Yeah, I think, um, and Karen Skiba, Karen Spader, and others jump in. Um, summer courses are going to be a challenge going entirely online. I think that um, you're going to get some suggested help from um, folks from campus on, on this. Marjean, go ahead and jump in. I always like when we start thinking about all these complex, thorny issues to go back to the basics. What are the learning objectives? Take a real hard look at your learning objectives and say, what are ways I can accomplish that? Maybe come up with two or three different ways that students can meet that learning objective. If it doesn't require synchronous discussion, in a language class there probably is a space that, that needs to take place, can that be shifted into some sort of other activity? So that when and if they have to do synchronous conversation, it can be for a limited time and they can accomplish other tasks doing multimodal types of activities. Yeah, and Karen Spader? Hi. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, it is hard, one, to go back to Marjean's point about back to the basics, looking at our learning objectives, um, but that variety is good, but you don't want to overwhelm, right? You want to allow students to s figure out the tech that you're going to be using and so picking a couple of things whether it's you know going with the combination of a little bit of synchronous opportunities but along with asynchronous learning that's occurring and using those synchronous time most efficiently as possible um, but then picking, okay, so we're just going to use the discussion forums and we're going to learn how to record ourselves for audio and visual or just audio. Arguably, that's the most important part of learning to speak a language, right? Um, so we're going to learn how to do 
AV discussion forum posts in Canvas, and we're going to learn how to use Blackboard Collaborate Ultra for our synchronous sessions. Um, and given a four-week four week time frame, which was in the activity sheet anyway, um, I wouldn't change groups. I would leave the groups, do small groups, but leave them because that allows, it's not a long time anyway, so to allow students to develop a relationship with each other and become comfortable um, being vulnerable with each other as they learn a new language. Um, so trying to be quick and brief, that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Very good. All right, Margaret? Yeah, uh, JT, I appreciate you raising such a good question, and I would just um, like to contribute uh, in addition to I do think you've got to go back to the learning objectives, and you have to ask yourself, how am I going to assess learner performance at the end of the day, right? And also, what are some of the learner engagement activities that would actually that's in your objectives. Now, that's sort of the, you know, that's that's the first thing you want to do. Another thing I would recommend is that given the short time frame, I would make sure that your approach is very standardized from one day to the next because the students don't need to be overwhelmed with, oh my God, we got to try a new technology today. What are we, you know, don't, you don't want them dreading the technology. What you want them to do is feel comfortable. So introduce a few uh, technology curriculum strategies, uh, stick with that, make it sort of a standard layout. If you can work in small groups, I think that would make a, a very big difference given your content requires some coaching and some listening and things like that. So standardized approach, stick to the learning objectives and the uh, affiliated assessments, uh, smaller group sizes. Um, so those are just a couple of ideas um, you might also then ask uh, the learners every day, have self-reflection at the end of the day. Are you comfortable with how we're going about this? And do you have recommendations of how we could make this better? Because the students often know uh, not only their own learning styles, but the technologies that work for them in their circumstances. Not that it's going to be a collective, but it would be some nice feedback. It would give them a sense ownership in the learning process and you know what we might all learn something from them very good and Jean yeah as you guys are talking I'm thinking about some of the undergraduate students in particular that are currently trying to learn from home especially um, first generation students who are likely to be living with their parents and siblings and if that's true they're not only sharing uh, internet space and maybe computers, maybe one computer in the house, the college student's computer. And so one thing to do to respond to their reality, their cultural reality in their home, is to ask students how they can incorporate um, some of the folks that are in their house into their learning plan. So for example, if you, uh, and you are mostly talking about foreign language students and courses, Maybe the students could do something where they sit with their little brother or sister and um, talk with them about something that the little kid is interested in that gives the both of them a chance to interact. Um, and that could be any other course as well that is relevant to other folks in the house. So just trying to think about how to adapt the learning environment outside of a standard classroom, which is much more controllable than the environment that these students are in right now. I think that's 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 brilliant, and it also is real for them, right? Um, because they, in that case, are living with their siblings. Um, that's part of their lived experience right now. Have them explain to their younger, you know, siblings what it is that they're learning. So put them in the teacher role. They'll have to think about well, how do I explain this? Who's my audience? What's important? What's not important? They're doing all of this amazing high-level blooms thinking um, when you have them do that. And it might be that they're not with their younger brothers or sisters. They might be with um, their colleagues or their other peers. It might be that they're talking, um, that you have them integrate the other courses that they're learning right now. So there's all kinds of opportunities for different, uh, different ways to do that. And we are at 2 o'clock. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a while and continue to answer questions. Uh, we haven't gotten to Colleen's, and 
number five I see, how to set up a peer review, although we do have some good resources listed there. So that's awesome. Thank you, people, for putting in the resources. Um, if you need to go, please go ahead and go. If you want to stick around and, and um, help us answer Colleen's question, that too. So, psychomotor skills. That's sort of anti-online, isn't it, Colleen? Tell us more about your, your, your situation. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, um, again, you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. I feel like an AT&T commercial, but... Um, right. Yeah, so this summer we'll be teaching um, palpation skills. So as Karen pointed out, I was thinking about um, video demonstrations as um, a pretty interesting way to have students, one, learn the material, and then two, demonstrate their efficiency with the uh, application. So. That's one thought, and I guess just figuring out the best platform for that as far as um, the videos themselves, and that's my second question. Would that be Kaltura? Uh-huh. Um, yes, it probably would be Kaltura, um, especially mm -hmm. for in physical therapy. Um, that's not a thing you would want to have on a, a, a public website. Um, or public video website. So Kaltura is, is besides being uh, campus promoted, campus supported, um, it's just, it's a, a smart decision. Um, right. And the videos would be short, you know, three, five minutes at most. Yep, the videos would be short, but they would also be, um, it would really, so the students can help you do some of this problem solving, right? Because they can take the videos with their, hands or their phones and they can, you know, or have, have their roommate or their family member, you know, hold it carefully enough so that they can see or that they can show. Because I imagine that a lot of this requires some really careful observation that might be difficult to see in a video, right? Correct. It requires some, like, clear camera placement. So that's a good thing because what that means is they would have to do it probably two or three times in order to get it clear enough, um, and that's more practice for them to do it. I used to have my students create a video as a welcome thing, so they had to create three-minute, hello, introduction, I'm so-and-so, and these are the things that I like, um, and they shared that with their um, classmates. It only took three minutes. Okay. You could theoretically do it in three minutes, but realistically, you know, they would do it several times because, oh, my double chin is showing or the lighting's wrong or I'm, my dog showed up and I didn't want my dog to show up. So they would do it several times in order to get it right. And each time they got better and better. Um, so it's, uh, that might be one way to get extra practice in for them. Right. I mean, there's definitely the benefit to that for sure. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add, Colleen, what I'm sorry, what classes were you saying you were dealing with here? So this is um, a class in the physical therapy curriculum. Okay. Um, and it seems like what we're talking about here is assessing students' uh, learning. But my follow-up or maybe side question is, um, are you familiar with the Journal of is it Visualize Experiments? No. Okay, so I'm going to put something in the chat real quick, and it's um, got an easy proxy in it, so it, you'll probably be prompted to sign in with your NetID and everything because it's through the library. Sure. Um, but what I, the link I shared was searching for the words physical therapy. Um, so that's what's returned and you can look at. I have no idea if there are videos in here that would be useful for you. Um, but nonetheless, this is, they're all video demonstrations on all sorts of different disciplines. Um, so just yeah. thought I'd bring that up in case you're looking for learning materials, um, whether it is, you know, in need of, you need them now and you don't have time to make them all yourself. You can't possibly make them all yourself. So there's a good resource for you if you weren't familiar. 
No, I wasn't. So thank you very much. It's sure. perfect, and I'll check it out. So in some ways, in building off of what Karen just did, um, you could have the students find these examples themselves. Um, and maybe they would want to find some examples themselves in order to mimic them in their own work. Um, so I'm thinking in, in a, a different area right now. Um, if I want my students to learn how to do something, I might say, go on YouTube and go find examples of that thing being done. They will go find an example that makes the most sense to them. Um, since in physical therapy there is a right way to do things, um, they can go find those examples themselves and then they would know one, they might see one or two or three examples. Um, so it's it's being reinforced every time that they see that content. Um, but then they have to sort of, they would take one, they would mimic it, and maybe the camera angles are better in one or, or less good in the other one. But they would, they would get a lot of that, they would do a lot of learning on their own. Um, so I don't know if that's useful or not, but it might be. Uh, it's a really good prompt, Karen. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, some, something to think about. I think we're challenged because one, it's their very first semester and it's an accelerated semester. So I think I need to be a little careful when yeah. I ask them to do perhaps, yeah. Well, and start off safe, you know, start off um, carefully in small steps. And then if that works out well, then next semester you can say, well, that worked out well. So let's ask for a little bit more. Right, right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from people that are still around? Uh, I had a quick question. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. I'm trying a new microphone, so I'm not sure. Can you hear this OK? Yeah. I, I just had a couple of tech questions. Um, how do you set up the Google Docs that you guys are working from? Oh, 